Thank you, Hongjin, for, for the introduction. Uh, so today I will uh, give you some highlights about my research, the problems that we are focusing on in my team, and uh, maybe have some discussions about some new projects that I'm involved in. Um, and as Hongjin says, we have met in Imperial College, which was probably the uh, best time in my working life where we had this uh, amazing, nice discussions about uh, science, especially with Hongjin, and I really miss those times very dearly. Um, but talking a bit about uh, myself, is it updating? Yeah. Um, my research journey started back in 2007 when I started my uh, PhD. And back then I was in Hodge University working mostly on uh, human computer interaction, working with haptic devices and looking at uh, more predictive interfaces without understanding that uh, the technologies I was developing had direct outcomes for robotics. Um, in 2010, I had visited the Technical University of Munich where I worked with uh, a men-sized mobile robot called Eddie, where we had transferred what I had done in my uh, PhD to, uh, to mobile robotics domain, where we tried to move a table along with the robot, which I will talk about in a while. Uh, in 2013, I moved to Imperial College London, where I worked on the, uh, in the assistive robotics domain. Um, and what I did was uh, learning assistive shared control policies for wheelchair driving. Um, in 2017, I moved to University of Lincoln uh, as an assistant professor uh, after a short while uh, working in Turkey. Um, and here I worked with a couple of different robotic systems, collaborated with colleagues in the Lincoln Center of Autonomous Systems. Um, some studies we did uh, were, were focusing on uh, social robotics, working on a museum robot to learn uh, recovery policies through human demonstrations. and. Currently uh, at the University of Nottingham, I'm mostly working on robotic manipulation uh, and enabling a human robot collaboration in complex um, sorting, uh, picking and placing tasks, which are common in uh, nuclear scenarios or disaster scenarios where you, you, you get to involve with hard decision making processes. Uh, and the overarching the theme of my research is basically working with humans. So everything I do is very much human centered. And at the beginning of the of my research journey, I started with looking into robots, robots, developing robots that collaborate with humans. Then the ideas uh, evolved into robots that can actually learn and leverage the information through from from the interaction with humans and. And currently, I'm trying to implement robots that can actually complement humans that make the most of that synergetic behavior, behaviors between the robots and the uh, humans interactions. And why I try to always put uh, humans in the loop is because uh, there are a lot of problems with full autonomy. And uh, as you may all know, that uh, most of the full autonomous robots that we see right now is uh, are, are stuck in lab environments. And in very complex real life scenarios, you still require some kind of human interventions or human decision making to complement the robot operations. Um, and you may also know about uh, the levels of autonomy definitions in robotics, which are also quite popular right now in uh, autonomous driving, uh, where we scale the robotic autonomy in between uh, two extremes. Uh, at the one end, there is pure teleoperation, which is also uh, implemented as wizards of Oz in different uh, domains. And at the other end, there are uh, autonomous operation, where there's full autonomy, where the robot can be left to operate fully without human intervention, which is um, not the reality at the, at the very moment. And in between these two extremes, there are a lot of different implementations, uh, different behaviors, where you can have scripted robot behaviors, you can have partial autonomy, where you can have hybrid systems, traded autonomy, shared autonomy, uh, or supervised autonomous behavior. And all these things I call human in the loop, uh, where you need to have a person somehow interacting with the robot to, uh, to complement 
whatever it's doing. And uh, some of the ideas in human uh, in the loop uh, are quite old, as old as the idea of teleoperation itself, uh, where we have the supervisory control schemes, uh, where uh, the human is typically used as a uh, emergency item where the robot actually operates, but the human always monitors it. it. He needs to be aware of the system states, any failures, any boundaries, and should interfere with the operation whenever something goes wrong. And although this idea is uh, quite old, um, it is still implemented in many of the systems. And these systems are uh, typically framed as traded control systems where the robot does something autonomously and there comes a time where the robot, uh, the human needs to intervene and then the intervention is over and the robot takes over again. So there is always like the robot operating, the human operating, the robot operating, the human operating. And currently the research is more on uh, making this switches, this trade over, handover process a little bit more intelligent, a little bit more responsive to the environment and so on. Uh, and actually, my research is more on shared control, which is different than traded control in the sense that shared control is always continuous and simultaneous, where you actually manipulate some of the uh, task yourself and some of the task is manipulated by the robots or where you share a level of autonomy or kind of guiding the robots uh, instead of taking the full control over some time. Um, and I, I could give you an example of traded autonomy in uh, a recent work of ours, which is uh, something we did in the University of Lincoln. And in this videos, you can see um, our robot Lindsay, uh, which is actually a social museum robot, which is currently at the collection museum in the uh, in Lincoln. Uh, and through a this, this robot was also used in uh, a care home, staying there for a, over a year and having a lot of navigation data. And one of the observations was that the robot failed miserably in many situations, whenever there's something uh, changing in the environment, some uncertainty coming over, some kind of uh, badly set parameters in navigation, et cetera. And some of the uh, failure situations can be seen here. Uh, the second one is quite miserable, as I say here. The robot is actually uh, facing some change in the topological map and it can't actually access the node and it's issuing this recovery behavior of rotating 360 degrees and then it thinks that it has found a way but it couldn't so this is kind of a uh, looping forever behavior and these situations are so common what was done in the care home study was uh, implementing some hacks some re recovery behavior so we, we could of course tweak the parameters, but that is not a one size fits all solution. So the parameters needs to be set every time and you can't really leave the robot. You need a per, uh, professional to be able to manage the parameters. You could develop recovery behaviors, rolling back and coming back, but they tell them work. And the one year study showed that uh, the best method to actually save the robot is to get human help to ask a human to push the robot to a nice place to make it find its location and so on. And you may think of it uh, if you have any robot vacuums in your house, it sometimes ask you to help me, save me and put me somewhere safe. And this is the same issue with this robot. Uh, however, the issue with the human help is, uh, human help is very precious because you can only ask for human help when the humans are nearby uh, and they are will if they are willing to help the robot. Uh, and most of the time, this helping behavior is unused. So there is a lot of data on how the humans are actually saving the robot, but that thing is actually not used. You're actually throwing the data away. And the idea of this study was um, to use that data, to save that data, to learn typical failure situations and learn certain trajectories which humans are using to keep the robot away from trouble, to save it so that it can go on with this global navigation. Uh, and for this study, we used the laser scan data and we took a temporal scan window to collect some features and trained uh, a Gaussian process classifier to classify between uh, specific failure and non-failure uh, situations. So this was uh, a, a um, lab study focusing on a single type of failure. So we were outputting one or zero for the failures. Uh, and then we were uh, asking the human if this is a failure to demonstrate a trajectory to save the robot and that those demonstrated trajectories were used 
uh, to learn uh, twist message twist uh, messages to uh, save the robot from that problem situation. And for this, we also used Gaussian process regression. Uh, and basically, what we did was on top of the global navigation, where there's a plan to go in between certain nodes on a topological navigation map uh, using the move base from ROS. Uh, we integrated our classifier and regressor so that there is the failure classifier would signal the planner to stop the global navigation and then execute the recovery through what is learned through the regression model. And those, the commands from the regressor is uh, outputted or given to the robot to uh, overwrite the velocity commands that would be normally given by the uh, global navigation. And the paradigm is uh, something like this, where we have the robot moving on, where the move base is controlling the robot. And then the robot finds that it's failing because the situation is similar to what it has encountered before. And the human demonstrates a recovery. This is not physical touch, but the human is giving some uh, joystick commands at the moment. Uh, and the robot is learning that recovery strategy when faced with the same situation or a similar situation, asking the human whether I should execute that recovery and executing that if the human approves that. Um, so this is an example of traded autonomy because there is a human, there is a very clear asking for help stage and there is a very clear approval to take over and hand over stages. Um, However, um, as I say, what I typically do in my research is more on the shared control domain. And the shared control, uh, I see as sometimes a better solution than traded control. Uh, and the shared control idea comes from the horse metaphor, uh, which is, again, an old idea where the robot is depicted as a horse. Uh, and the robot here is aware of the environment, aware of the intentions of the user. Uh, and helps you to achieve better performance or uh, safety through shared actions. Um, and in here, what, what you, when you think about the horse metaphor, basically what you see is the use of these reins are actually very, a very active process. And there are these pulling, pushing uh, motions are actually your only communication channel with the, with the horse. Okay, there may, there may also be some kind of sounds, but this is the main channel. So it's a very, Haptic, uh, haptic based control system where you can actually have a synergetic behavior with an animal. And the aim of the uh, shared control I see that is uh, to maybe program a robot to act like a horse. And I believe that this uh, has a lot of potential for the haptics because the haptic communication, especially in collaborative tasks, especially in physical tasks is very prominent. Uh, and, and we do have a lot of communication which is not very well understood. Um, and one example I worked on uh, earlier is the table carrying example with the robot. And this was a collaboration with the Technical University of Munich, where we tried to complete this task along with the robot, where we had predefined points in the space, uh, where the human and the robot were collaborating to move a table together. And this is a very collaborative task. And by collaborative, I mean that they're physical and the human and the robot are almost touching each other through an object in this example. So the contact is existent uh, and it's a little bit different than maybe cooperation where you share the environment, but you have to share the task as well. Uh, and this task is really collaborative in the sense that you can't actually finish it on your own because the table is very, very large. And in here, what we uh, examined was the role distributions of human and the, and the robot. And we had defined certain leadership roles where the dominance behavior of the robot was uh, defined as a leader or a follower role. And in between the leadership and followership roles, we had certain weights that, that enabled more leadership or less leadership. And the idea here was to introduce a parameter to set that leadership behavior and change it on the fly based on the force information. Um, so I won't go much into the uh, details of this work, but uh, what we had in this study was that was force measurements from the human because we did put a, a force sensor in the grasping point of the uh, of the table, uh, and we knew that 
we knew the target position, so we could compute a desired force to move the table to a part target position. And we assumed the role allocation parameter that is controlling the level of autonomy of the robot. And zero meant uh, robot control, one meant human control for this lambda parameter. And the uh, paradigm was quite simple. We were just calculating the force contribution of each agent. Uh, given the desired force, so this is what the human and the robot should be applying, given this assumption of the role allocation. And we were basically looking at an agreement criteria, which was in that specific example, the directions of the forces. If I, if the human is actually applying force in this direction and the desired force is in this direction, I say that this is an agreement. And in case of an agreement, we would increase the robot autonomy, uh, thinking that the robot is already doing something correctly. And in case of this agreement, we were reducing the robot autonomy, thinking that it's doing something incorrectly. And we did implement different ways to change the lambda parameter. And uh, this actually gave us a lot of uh, nice observations to, uh, to reflect on how we should implement the dynamic role allocations. Um, and here I move on to another example, which was which is an earlier thing that I worked on. Uh, what, what is interesting about this is this is a haptic game, <clears throat> which is played along with the robot here. You can use a haptic device to move the ball, and the robot, the controller, can actually help you move it. So it is exactly the same example as the table carrying scenario. And we had exactly the same role allocation scheme where we had introduce some spring constants on a virtual model to move the object, which is the ball here. And we change these parameters to assign different roles to human and the robot. And there are a lot of applications that you can just take this kind of a model and play with the uh, role allocation parameters or spring constants to assign different ways to the operation of the human and the robot, which is a very neat way to implement shared autonomy in a, variety of application domains. Um, and the uh, results of our studies basically show that uh, a dynamic role allocation is uh, much better when compared to constant role allocation in terms of test performance, timing, effort requirements of the human. And it, when you display some information through haptics to the human, which is by default in the robot case, but in, for example, with haptic, uh, haptic devices, the humans understand, uh, humans can actually convey their intention to the uh, robot in, an uh, in a very fluent way. You don't need any extra key presses, etc. But the forces that you apply are actually indicative of your intentions. Um, and haptics uh, is also seen to be useful to provide better understanding of what is going on in the robot's world by the humans as well. Uh, however, our findings, uh, because we always do user studies and take qualitative information as well, we found that the users actually uh, favor constant role locations. Constant, you are the leader, I am the follower, or we are sharing the task 50-50 kind of an uh, arrangement much more than a dynamic scheme, because in especially the robot study, we found that um, the dynamic behavior was seen as very unpredictable, so their trust was actually lowered for those cases. Um, so now moving on to um, other studies where we focus on shared control, uh, I want to discuss a bit about uh, our work in Imperial, where I looked at assistive robotics working on uh, an intelligent wheelchair application. And in this uh, work, we wanted to learn how to help a person. And in here, uh, Tom, who's currently in UCL, is uh, driving a wheelchair. So the wheelchair is fully autonomous. And what he's demonstrating here is that he doesn't, he doesn't actually need to do anything because we have the technology to have to sort out the navigation and known environments. Um, and this seems like a good engineering solution, but it's a very bad solution in assistive robotics because many wheelchair users, they want more control. And in this example, what you see is a child uh, who's uh, being driven by the uh, wheelchair while, while, while the wheelchair is actually managed very closely by the uh, professional. And this child had a brain surgery, who, which inhibited his um, sense of fear. So NHS is actually not giving him a wheelchair and he can't actually 
walk. So it's, it's a dead luck in this situation because he can't actually cognitively develop because he's lacking the mobility abilities. And for this case, what you need to do is to uh, really enable safety. Whereas in this first case, um, you could forget a little bit about safety because the human would be willing to do some maybe uh, controlled movements and uh, managing the safety on, on his own. So these two extremes maybe illustri illustrate the case that we need uh, intelligently built shared control paradigms. Um, however, it is really hard to understand humans from an engineering perspective at least uh, because we don't have the correct links we don't have the correct chance to work with these patients uh, so it is really hard to understand how you should implement the personalized assistive policies and for this reason uh, we came up with uh, the idea of uh, learning from humans and in this example we implemented a shared control paradigm uh, where we put a teleoperator to also manage the wheelchair and in here as you can see i'm not actually driving the wheelchair the person is driving it however at any time i can actually use the joystick which is a haptic joystick in this case which is not too important to manipulate the motion of the robot and to stop it if i wanted to and from that data, once again, we learned policies to learn how to best assist that person. And in here, uh, we didn't really do any dynamic, well-defined autonomy changes, but because the policy was actually learned from human demonstrations and the human wasn't uh, providing assistance at all times, it was uh, automatically generating shared control but to dynamically change the control authority to provide more guidance. Uh, and in here, we did put haptics to put better awareness of the system states because the guidance often feels like um, drifting or some malfunction of the joystick. And if you feel that there is a tension in your hand, we thought that this would help people to understand the autonomy is trying to do something and it's not malfunctioning. Uh, and in this example, we had given the humans the full autonomy to overrule system decisions. So at any time, if I felt that I would maybe crash something, I could stop the wheelchair. Uh, and, and this is, again, a decision on how you implement the shared control of this. Um, this application and in here as i say um, we did work with initially with the teleoperator so in this one single trial the teleoperator is guiding me uh, in this route so we are drawing a figure eight around uh, these obstacles and the teleoperator is sometimes stopping me sometimes making me slower so that we can have some data about how that person would correct my emotion and we uh, use Gaussian processes again here so we took the user commands the environmental context our instances to certain obstacles and the robot state which are the velocity of the robot to learn a, a regression model to estimate the assistance commands whenever the uh, teleoperator is out of the loop so in here what you see is the teleoperator is gone and i'm actually working with the assistance and in here uh, the red line is my commands. Uh, I don't think it's very visible, but the green line is the, the green arrow is the uh, robot's command. So it is actually, it has learned to guide me over the figure eight figure by making the uh, rotations a little bit more severe than um, what I am doing. Uh, and in this example, we also looked at what would happen uh, if I choose not to, for example, go into the corridor as was demonstrated to me and instead move uh, move forward, for example. And in here, uh, my command is to move forward, whereas the command of the uh, estimated assistance is not to push me through the corridor, but to push me toward the open area because the model itself is actually learning from uh, relative distances, not encoding the path on its own. So we showed that it can actually generalize to a certain extent. Obviously, it is dependent on the uh, distances that we had learned on and, this, and in some ways the environment that we learned it on. 
Um, but, but this seems like a nice way to very easily program a robot using only one single dry data to uh, to learn some to, to learn some shared control policies. Um, so I will skip the user study. We did a user study looking into uh, the learning assistance uh, success, assistance performance, and the generalization capabilities. And we had done some uh, testing on how well we are estimating. And in here, uh, after this kind of a demonstration where the red areas are where the assistance is more predominant, for example, this was heavy assistance, there's not much assistance here. We were looking into human-human uh, interaction where there's the ground truth, which the human was actually guiding me, uh, guiding the subject, not me, obviously. Uh, and we estimate the assistance and looked at how well they were fitting. In the different scene, the uh, fit was okay, but not really perfect. But in the same scene, uh, we had seen that even if this was not exactly what the uh, model was taught on, we could very well estimate the ground truth uh, and how the assistance should be given. Um, so I will again skip this, but uh, very, very shortly, we had done a very complex experiment for this case. One case was real human-human interaction, and the second case was human-robot interaction, and we turned on and off the haptic feedback as well to see whether we can at least go a little bit close to the human assistance. Uh, and what we had seen was uh, in the human-robot interaction cases, the lab completion times was uh, longer. It took longer to uh, finish the task. But uh, the distances to obstacles uh, was similar. So the learned policy was actually um, safeguarding uh, similarly to the human. The test performance was not really affected by the haptic communication. So this was a good thing because it didn't apparently introduce mental workload. Um, and the effort requirement for the human under human robot and human human cases were similar when no feedback was provided. So uh, the effort case is actually showing that the introduction of haptic feedback is changing something in the operation of the uh, humans when they are working with robots, but we don't understand the reasons of this quite well. And it is probably something about uh, collaboration and how people are actually adapting their muscle synergies to each other. Um, and one of the most important uh, outcomes was that in the human-human interaction case, uh, with haptic feedback, the human's motion jerkiness was increasing. And this is another indication that there is some muscle activation that people are using when they are feeling the forces, which was not actually apparent in the human-robot case. Um, so I will now move on very quickly to what we are doing. So I'm kind of doing a bit longer. Hopefully we have the time. Uh, so at the moment, uh, I, I am leading this uh, HEAP project, which is a Kistera uh, funded project, also co-funded by EPSRC, which is a collaboration between INRIA, TUVN, IDIAP, AIT, and KIT. And in the HEAP project, we are looking into robotic manipulation. Um, we are targeting very complex uh, manipulation and grasping scenarios where you have this heap of objects which can be broken pieces, part pieces, where uh, the robotic sorting performance is very challenged, just by, challenged by the uh, scene dynamics. Um, and the aim of the project is to create benchmarking algorithms for manipulating objects in the heap. So we are developing more realistic simulations uh, we are developing uh, reproducible real setup using Franca Emika arms. We are developing 3D printable object models to be disseminated with the community so that people can implement their algorithms and test it uh, with, with Franca robots if they have uh, any. Um, and this simulation framework that we built uh, is managed by KIT at the moment and it is public through this link. Uh, and on top of this, we have implemented a teleoperation interface because uh, at least my interest in this project is how to enable human in the loop control and how to combine teleoperation performance where we can guide the people when needed. Um, so we had implemented real-time control and communication for the Franco robots using the uh, Franco lib and the 
simulation lab software, which enables real-time force control as well. And we uh, support long distance celebration through using a uh, VPN connection. And the simulation framework does work in uh, simulated teleoperation setups, but we can have much of the code in the simulation framework and directly reflect that to the physical teleoperation setup where we can have two physical robots. And our teleoperation setup is using identical robots where the master device is actually another Franca device. And we have managed to implement a force feedback architecture for displaying environmental forces that is uh sensed by the franca arm on the uh on the master robots so, so that the teleoperators can feel the scene uh, interactions um however we also use haptic devices so um here's one example where we use a haptic device to manipulate the motion of a uh, follower robot in simulation and the same device or a similar device can also be used to move the uh, operation of a real robot from, from a distance. Um, and what we have been working on for the last year is the shared control teleoperation framework. And in this one, we are thinking about um, learning again from humans so if there is an expert teleoperator can we collect data offline from their operations and use that data to learn certain policies to reach certain objects and we do this through pro mp modeling uh, and we learn from mp trajectories that can be used to control the assistance in real time uh, operation and in here we develop an assistance controller based on how well the motion is fitting the parameter trajectories that are already learned and we feed in these to our bilateral teleoperation framework where we can also implement environmental forces and in here we turn on and off the environmental forces and assistance forces because uh, they are actually they may conflict with each other or cancel each other so there is another block which chooses between whether to uh, issue environmental forces or contact um, or assistance forces to the user um, and this is one uh, very recent study completed by my master's student in the last year and in this work uh, we looked into developing haptic guidance based on human intent predictions and again here we used pro mp trajectories to learn how to reach these objects and how to place them in certain boxes. And in here, the setup is um, set as two colors, set with two colors where we have colored objects which are set to be moved onto the same colored bins. However, uh, we didn't tell the robot about the colors. So this is uh, given to the human to decide to mimic a, a very complex scenario for example in a nuclear environment where the robot the robot wouldn't actually know which object to handle but the human using his or her common sense could select which object is dangerous and maybe put it in a specific place so this this environment is a mock-up for that kind of a situation where only the human knows which object is which color and which object should go to which bin. And this problem was uh, looking into these learned trajectories and looking at the uh, closeness to this trajectory, the closeness of the robot to the trajectory to estimate the intent. So in here we have four objects and the intention is actually changing. For example, uh, the robot is in, has Intent, uh, estimated that the human was intending the Lego piece and then uh, the tool and now the Lego piece uh, again uh, and assistance was generated haptically to lead the person in a, uh, in a quicker way, in an easier way toward those objects and the estimations were also done for the buckets where we were estimating the closeness to, to the buckets on uh, using the pro MP trajectories and pro MP trajectories were also modulated to account for changes in the scene and looking at those to uh, set the assistance parameter weight the assistance parameter so that we can manipulate whether we should be strongly pushing the person or not 
Um, and finally, uh, I want to just uh, give an example, uh, or maybe like a heads up on what we are doing in human-human interaction, because uh, we have been spending a lot of time in understanding human collaboration. We have been doing a lot of uh, experiments using two humans when carrying objects together. So this is uh, motivated by the table carrying object uh, scenario. Uh, we had done experiments using in virtual worlds where two agents are manipulating a common object or in the real world where they are uh, lifting and placing objects. And the idea here is to understand the behaviors of the people and the behaviors uh, are currently defined as conflict or harmony kind of behaviors, which is defining the interaction between the agents. Uh, and in he, up to now, we have been able to uh, extract certain features of the uh, interactions, looking at only forces. And by using only forces, we are now able to understand whether the motions of the humans are agreeing with each other or not. Um, and this information we are thinking about moving to the robots very soon so that if we can understand if the agents are actually in agreement in a more clever way can we still introduce the role allocation parameters can we still create adaptive shared control parameters and through the haptics another question is can we also generate nonverbal communication formalisms um so this is all that we are doing i just want to give an uh, maybe an advertisement about one of the new projects that I got involved in. So we, I'm involved in the Trustworthy Human Robot Teams project, which is funded by the Trustworthy Autonomous Systems Hub of uh, UKRI. And in this project, we are looking into how trust is accomplished within teams where uh, there are humans and robots working as part of teams. And uh, how can trust be achieved toward robots by the persons in the teams. Um, in this project, we, are, uh, we have formed a very multidisciplinary team, which is an exciting and interesting experience for me. We have people from engineering, but business school, uh, law school. We have a general clinical surgeon in the, in the group. Uh, we have people from sociology across four universities. Um, and in here, we are looking into two different use cases. The first use case is a UE cleaning robot use case, uh, which is getting more popularity with the COVID. Uh, however, we actually don't really know how effective these UE cleaning robots are, especially if they're in complex scenes, such as in a classroom where there are like keyboards and small stuff. And if we even run a UE cleaning robot, does it actually clean or not? And should we actually trust it? So some colleagues are developing certain sensors for this robot, and we are looking into the effectiveness of the sensor studies, but we are also doing uh, more qualitative work on uh, developing questionnaires and user studies to see uh, how cleaners are actually thinking about that or how they are using these robots. And the other case study we have is a surgical simulation, um, surgical robotics uh, case study. Uh, and in here, the current work is mostly qualitative. There are interviews going on with patients, medical staff, surgeons, assistant surgeons, nurses, et cetera. But uh, in the second phase of the project, we will be planning on looking at how trust can be practically accomplished in the operation theater, looking at video recordings of real operations, and maybe having some simulated experiments where we can issue some calls and see whatever happens when the robot fails. Um, so that is all. <laughs> Thank you for listening to me. This was a longer presentation than promised, but I'm happy to have your questions. Thank you, Aisha. Any question? Okay. Iran? Uh, hello, can, can, you, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you, Aisha. Um, uh, impressive work. I really enjoy your talk. Um, you. It was very fun to watch. It's, it's interesting because while I was listening to your talk, I was, uh, I was thinking about trust and kind of prepare a question to ask you about trust. But then your last slide, you're, you're kind of answering my question, but it, I create another question regarding trust. 
So my original question was, you know, you don't, when in the human robot collaboration, you don't, it really depends on, uh, you know, how much uh, a human, uh, you know, in the case of it, we have several options for navigation. It really, the interaction is dependent on how much a human uh, trusts the uh, robot's decision. But then, so I, I think that in the, your new project, you were looking at this, but what is, what is interesting in the last process and what's come, my question comes is, as far as I guessed from your one slide uh, explanation is, so you design a model and then you ask a questionnaire or you know, people, oh, do you trust in this situation? Do you trust in that situation? But what if, I mean, the, 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 the issue about trust it actually could change the design process in the first place. So the, pr I, the problem I see with this kind of approach when we design something and we, you know, we present the end things to the, basically the lack of participatory design is we, well, we don't, uh, we pose the wrong question in the first place to the user. And my concrete question is have you uh, uh, are you looking at the participatory design um, kind of approach in case of uh, like formulate form, form, formulating trust in your in your architecture yes uh, we are planning on that i also have a, a phd student is planning on co-design of uh, more trustworthy automated system so it's not only looking into robotic applications but uh, looking into more digital manufacturing scenarios or something like a failure identification on a screen-based automation uh, things. And he is thinking about co-designing, but also for uh, the reason behind having these interviews and not, not giving people only maybe questionnaires or surveys is to understand actually what are the components of this interaction which cause more or less trust, which I think is important to develop better interfaces because uh, as part of my, for example, in the even in the table carrying task, uh, it is quite old, but we did ask people about trust by then, although it wasn't a, as big as this today. Uh, and it was funny because we did um, implement, for example, different ways to change the role allocation and someone, some was quite jerky. So it was changing like almost like an on off kind of a thing and some was more more uh, fluent and people's answer to that single question even was changing when, when the paradigm was different. And then we were thinking, oh, this is the same paradigm implemented just a little bit different, but it's actually changing the sensation completely. So uh, we are, especially for the uh, UE cleaning case, there's ongoing effort by some other uh, partners on developing a user interface because we are also thinking um, I could put a sensor on the robot and it could show me how effectively it actually cleaned the environment. But in order to just create trust, do I need that information? If I knew, for example, my robotic hoover at home has this facility to detect dust and it sometimes does things, those around. And I, I think it does it. I kind of trust it, but... I also look at the outcome and so on, so I'm not so sure. But th these are important. If it told me that I found dust here, that's why I'm doing this, probably I would have trusted it more. And this is only possible to capture, as you say, through in interviews or maybe speaking with the people who has actually used those systems. Um, and with the surgical use case, it's a little bit more difficult because there are companies uh, but still, I think it would be good because we have the simulation and we could still, in the simulation, develop different interfaces and show that maybe this is a better way as the suggestion to the company to display certain information. Because trust, especially in this operation room, is extremely important. It's very high stress. And uh, I have watched a few surgery operations and it is mind-blowing. And it is like this team of people who are also forming a team with the robot, which they do trust. Well, yeah, we <laughs> trust human more than I trust human more than robots, especially the trust I, I, the robots I make or I program. Definitely, I don't trust them. <laughs> but cheers! Thank you so much. It, it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Masuma. Well, Any I other ask question? a question, Yungen, sure, yeah. I go? Go ahead. And if some other student wants to go, they can go first. I I can't see the. 
my interface is a little limited so i can't see if someone else has their hand up or anything uh, uh, if not yes you can go you can go okay uh, thank you uh, so uh, i should i have a, a, a probably a very very basic question right uh, um, and if it's uh, silly i apologize in advance so uh, so if if you if you take any of these uh, things you've done right i mean it's not so much a particular project because they all have to me a similar flavor of the uh, human and the robot trying to uh, share uh, have some some form of shared control so so i was wondering like um, are you are you okay so what is the basic premise here does the do the human and the robot have some kind of shared knowledge to begin with i mean how do they know um, uh, to do some kind of sharing shared control right if you imagine between two humans then there must be some kind of shared vocabulary shared understanding something to begin with and then you can say under these circumstances uh, you can do one action or the other other uh, teammate if you wanted to think of it that way can do another action right i'm trying to understand in your sort of uh, approach what is the sort of uh, how do i put this what is what is the uh, general uh, uh, assumptions and other things you are making do they share with some kind of shared knowledge and then there is some action choices and based on certain conditions uh, they will decide who does what or is there actually one agent or one uh, 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 agent trying to do something together jointly for all, everybody together i mean what is the general uh, principle followed here hmm. um if I, if i hear it right uh, you're kind of asking a, a bit about planning i guess uh, about the robots in some of the examples do know for example in the table carrying one what it needs to do so it's actually just choosing how it should uh, arrange the effort sharing so in in some of the examples for example in some of the mobile navigation kind of examples that i'm working on we actually have an existing plan that the robot thinks is the correct one but then it's uh, the vocabulary is more on the haptic channel about the communication so for example the robot may think that i am going to this location which is a uh, node in my in my map and this is my plan because i think the task should be completed like that so it's in some, some some of the applications that we have we do give knowledge about the task we make it to certain plans depending on the existing knowledge that the robot has but then again uh, this uh, for example this conflict harmony uh, or interaction state estimation project that we are building is working on that problem like if the robot let's say there is an obstacle here and if the robot is trying to go go to the start it and if you're driving through this route because this is what the robot has actually computed what happens if the human tries to go to our distraction and obviously in here there should be some kind of a take over where the conflict should be understood and the role should be blended toward the leadership of the human where the robot gets maybe gets to do some kind of replanning to uh, estimate maybe the intended target of the person so uh, information so what i am not probably getting is like you know to do this kind of um, reasoning or something right uh, the mm-hmm. both the robot and the human will need to know a lot more about the task and the domain and mm-hmm. i think from what you're telling me you're saying that these things are preloaded as in like they're given uh, prior knowledge to the about what task it's going to do and mm-hmm. what does it know about the domain because i mean you can't there's a difference between moving a table or something around or any of the other tasks you did in one room as against another room or like you know the kind of motion you want to take may also change depending on what the object is that you're trying to move so all this from what you're telling me if i've understood you correctly is a uh, uh, prior knowledge for both the robot and the human they mm-hmm. both know that we are going to do this together and they both know that the other a- agent if you will also understands this reasonably well so now i have mm-hmm. a different question so mm-hmm. if these things are preloaded uh, so then what is the crucial bit is a crucial bit or the key uh, question you're looking at is when to transfer control between the two is that the crucial question um when is a crucial question how is a crucial question also um 
I mean, if, if they have prior knowledge, then how is in some sense also a choice, right? From one of N choices, mm-hmm. right? So then the when seems to be the difficult one. And then once the when is decided, I'm not saying the how is easy, but I'm saying that then the how becomes a choice from one of, I don't know, in your case, you had one of two options, one of N options, things like that, right? Am, mm-hmm. I, am I understanding this correctly? Again, as I said, uh, I started with the disclaimer. Yes, yes. yes. I, I think, yeah, that, that, that is something that we do in some of the applications. In, um, for example, in the human-human interaction uh, experiment, we didn't actually uh, embed it any kind of test knowledge. So the robot is, well, when the robot will be implemented, let's say, will only uh, have, have atomic motions in its dictionary, let's say, so that it can rotate, it can go forward with the human. So we are kind of putting back to back these atomic uh, motions. So in that specific example, for example, there is not test knowledge, but in many of the examples we have, there is test knowledge. And the big problem here is uh, when uh, the task is not very simple, where there is possibly uh, maybe two, three, maybe, maybe one, one decision that the robot is very sure that the human will be doing. But when there are multiple choices, some of them the robot doesn't actually know how to do. So the human's uh, knowledge or human's operation maybe could also help the robot to learn these new maybe trajectories or new ways to performing a task. And that could be like an iterative learning process. Or uh, the robot could actually just release the control altogether when it's not actually confident that the task that the human is doing is something completely different than what it knows. So it shouldn't really push the human towards doing something that it has planned to do. Could I I just ask one, and I'll I'll stop after this because I don't want to take all the time. I want to give others a chance. So one last probably question. So this will help me understand. So can you give me one example where the robot does not have, from any of the examples you picked, say, I don't want to pick one and like, you know, make the wrong choice. So you pick and like, you know, from that one, like, you know, what I want to understand if there is without prior task knowledge, how can this shared control happen? I'm very curious because unless you know what you're doing you can't reason about it you can't figure out when i should hand over or you can't even reason uh, how i can learn from the human if i were a robot right so so can you give me an example please um, I mean, it has to have know, i thought it's knowledge yeah. what yeah you you can uh, for example in this uh, object carrying example you, what you can do is you can choose to maybe just mimic whatever the human is doing so the, if the human is moving in the translating the object you could choose to maybe do exactly the same or you could take a look into the situation and whether uh, the human is intending to actually move the object in that translational direction or maybe trying to rotate it and make a decision to complement the motion and if you're not really confident as robot in what what kind of atomic movement the human is trying to do maybe just get into a more compliant mode and then assisted until until you can see that this is a, exactly like a rotational moment. Uh, so without test knowledge, the extent of the tasks that you can do are really something like that. Like when I'm moving an object from here to here, we could, you know, uh, obey a minimum jerk trajectory so I can try to mimic your motions or I could be a little bit more proactive to understand what is the intended type of motion and try to complement that. But the shared autonomy here is how actively I'm going to complement you. Because if we are, for example, carrying an object together with you, you may feel that I'm kind of rotating it. But if you kind of rotate it all together, then that would be very jerky because you misunderstood me. Uh, so, so this is one example. Uh, I think another example where you could have partial test knowledge is the robot can be given uh, a certain plan to solve a task. So it, for example, knows a trajectory to reach this object and it is always doing this, but then the human is actually doing it in another way. And this is something that the robot is not taught taught before. So what you can do is you can actually leverage that information looking at what the human is doing and then putting it in your dictionary of behaviors and then maybe using those to build your understanding of the task a little bit better. And then the shared autonomy can come in between here to select them between whichever task, uh, task segment you're on. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I, I think I understand this. So what you're saying is, uh, it's not that it cannot, it can learn without task knowledge. In that case, it's going to be a trivial, probably a uh, following mm-hmm. of a behavior, but to learn, mm-hmm. it will need something to, and that's what I thought too. So I just wanted to yeah. check that. So, yeah, okay. So yeah. it can only learn something substantial if uh, 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 some sort of common understanding exists between the human and the robot for the task and the domain without which, uh, because that's what I would expect between two humans, right? You can't yes. teach the other person something if, I mean, all this sort of, you can't learn from scratch. Uh, it won't work very well when you're trying to do a task. You will have to have some shared understanding mm-hmm. before learning yeah. can happen. Okay, I, thank I you. We, we do build it eventually. Like whenever, it, it feels like it's similar to carrying something with closed eyes or so on. If somebody just gives it to you, you, you kind of learn very quickly as a human. You evaluate the object, you evaluate the task, what are we doing, or is it something I know? Um, but we do eventually develop an understanding between ourselves. And for example, for the carrying tasks, if you know what you are going to do, like we are going to put this table to the kitchen, uh, that then you make a plan ahead. It's not like, are we just following each other? What are we doing? Kind of a slower reaction kind of a thing. But, but all the haptic things or the collaboration things is kind of uh, the interplay between these more deliberative planning aspects plus more reactive aspects. So I, I think the shared control comes very fluently whenever you have to react to something, which is in combination with the deliberative plans, test knowledge related uh, aspects that are common and uh, uh, commonly known by the human robot team. Uh, thank you. I will let uh, someone else, uh, how to say this. Uh, thank you. Yeah, if you have thank more you. questions, we can, we can have a chat sometime later. <laughs> yes, please. I'll, I'll, I can do this often. Yeah. yeah. Anyone has more questions? Actually, I have. Uh, so uh, I'm just wondering, uh, what kind of sensory data are you using for this interaction? or sensing the uh, humans mm-hmm. or uh, robots intention? Yeah, so we are currently just using for stork sensors. Uh, so we are in the manipulation uh, example, we are using the torque sensors on the joints of the Franca robot, and that's all. Um, for haptic interactions, you kind of have uh, force information, which is simulated. So you compute the force, so it's a computed force. But uh, it is similar uh, and it can be accurate based on your scalings and so on. Uh, and for the human experiments, we have, uh, again, for source sensors. <laughs> so do you think the vision sensor will be helpful? And yes, I think how, so. how it How it can be helpful, do you think? I, I think um, in, in, in line with what Mohammed was asking, I think uh, in order to maybe develop some more especially symbolic understanding about the task, et cetera. Combining these approaches with vision is beneficial, especially in the manipulation scenario. We do use uh, vision, for example, for the object tracking. We didn't really use vision, but uh, vision is the proper way to do it, uh, at least by putting some power sensor on the object and then tracking the object so that you can manipulate the, uh, the, your trajectories or manipulate how you would grasp the object if it's changing position. Although we are doing it in very um, in simulation right now, but obviously with the real robot, we have to uh, see how the scene changes because especially if the interaction is not as continuous as have holding an object and keeping it all together all the time, if you have to reach for something, etc., you need to have vision. Okay, <laughs> sounds great. Um, Iran, do you have another question? Uh, yes, I have this question. You may comment on that during your talk. I may miss that. So, uh, you're talking about a lot about shared autonomy. So. In the case of a sliding autonomy, um, imagine you, you know, a person, for example, in a wheelchair, the example you, one of the examples you showed, uh, have a full control, but you want, in the case of rehabilitation, imagine you want to basically, uh, sorry, imagine we start from robot, 
Totally. And then we want to enhance the capability mm -hmm. to the human in the other way around. So in the case of sliding and basically give the full control to the human. So I'm wondering how you can actually learn the moment that when happen so that, you know, you go from one level of autonomy to another level of autonomy. Quite a bit, uh, yeah, a simpler question than, than uh, Muhan asked. So do you know, do you have, do you have any idea how you can move from basically a full autonomy from the robot side to human side in case that we want to enhance the capability of it? Hmm. So, so this is about like in a rehabilitation scenario, obviously, uh, the aim is just the opposite to autonomous re yeah. robotics research, because in, in those we try to make the robot more autonomous in rehabilitation assisted robotics, you try to make the human more autonomous. Uh, and typically, we do have these uh, in rehabilitation uh, assist as needed or assist less than needed kind of paradigms already working quite nicely. Uh, and, and these are, I think, very much in line with the sliding autonomy idea anyway. So you, if you can understand, for example, um, a criteria, you, if you can define any criteria, it can be ta task performance, for example. If a person is not really performing well, you could probably, as a therapist, hold the hand of the person and do the motion yourself, because that is still useful by telling that you should push, you should pull, and so on. Uh, but, but making the robot do most of the motion. And as long as you see, you feel maybe more tension, so this can be true for sensing, mm -hmm and maybe looking at some kind of performance measure, you can make the robot less and less active. Uh, and in one study we did, uh, we were using some kind of uh, biophysiological sensors such as uh, skin conductance and so on to estimate the stress level of the person. Uh, and we did it on a kind of a virtual world scenario, but they, they are quite, uh, in some ways successful in estimating, for example, stress or changes in the person's uh, bodily um, measurements, let's say. Uh, and that could, for example, those kind of things can also be integrated uh, to maybe make the human a little bit at the uh, you know, sweet spot of the stress level so that you don't actually push them too much, you don't tire them too much. There are a lot of uh, things through different probably sensors to be measured. The only thing that you have to do with the shared autonomy examples, as I had discussed, uh, as you may imagine, is deciding on the best criteria, like how much do we agree, how confident I am with the human's intention, uh, how, uh, how well this person is doing this task, or how dangerous is this task for, the, for example, the wheelchair example, so that I should change the autonomy. Uh, and it does once again, like uh, probably require a lot of expert knowledge, some more co-design and so on. Uh, but some of it is common sense and fine tuning. Cheers. Thank you. So much. Okay. Uh, any other question? No. Okay, so I think it's been already past the time. So Aisha, thank you very much. I thank you for your excellent talk. Let's thank to the speaker together. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And so thanks for all the nice questions. This was really nice. And <laughs> thanks for inviting. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I look Next forward to seeing you. Yeah. <laughs> sure, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Okay. okay, thank you everyone. Uh, thank, thank you. you. I say. Hope you stay safe and we can meet again soon. Yeah. Yeah. See you soon. Bye bye. Bye bye.